if something happens to me, this money comes in tax free to my family so that we can have a, a dynasty level trust that kind of becomes a family bank, which means we never have to use the banking system again. We can do everything within our own family, charge an interest rate to our heirs that's better than what the banks are charging, earn some interest on that, save them interest on that, and kind of have something that's more of a perpetual wealth machine versus a, I don't know, I just, I don't love that every bank has the biggest building in every downtown. Um, so the question is, is Velocity or cash flow banking still a great vehicle for revenue building and leveraging investments if it's a part of our investor DNA? What I like about it is it's like, I look at it as like my midterm cash strategy. My short-term cash strategy is just cash in a bank, just because, uh, you know, it's, I could wire it out that day. I could stop putting money in that day. And there's, there's almost no restriction. Almost there's almost no return where cash value gives me a big boost. It gives me liability protection, tax protection, and a death benefit that I can utilize in the future to increase my cash flow. And I can use that cash along the way. So I love it as like a place to store cash when I don't know what else is viable or where I don't want to invest in anything else. Um, but at the same time, I don't just, I, I for years just left my cash value alone. But as we're seeing a massive amount of money enter the economy without value behind it. Now, when they say printing money, let me be really clear. They're not printing money. They just push a button and it shows up on a computer screen. There's about, for every dollar that we have printed, there's $600 circulating out there in digital amounts. So with that in mind, I actually bought some real estate this year. Now, not the kind of stuff that I have to have tenants with and that, that kind of thing. I bought a property that has a pond and has a place we're gonna put a music studio, which is going to be an instrumental part of what free flow does as we move forward in the future. So when you look, GarrettGunnerson.com is a free flow asset. It's Corey and I are business partners in free flow and we've got this, this team and we're looking at entertainment as the language of the masses. Entertainment is the gateway to transformation. And we know that comedy is one form, performance is another, and music is yet the other. So I had to take cash value and do something with it because it's starting to be devalued with money just being printed. I put some in crypto. I bought some real estate that's going to be very useful for where we're headed with free flow. And also for, you know, I love it because we're trying to build the hundred acre woods in Utah, a place where we can play and, and create. And, uh, you know, I, I told Corey that I was Winnie the Pooh, but I started reading the book about Winnie the Pooh. I worry way too much. I'm definitely not Winnie the Pooh yet. I'm, uh, and I called Corey Piglet and he thought it was a short joke, but it wasn't. It was just like uh, Winnie's best friend. And, and I, you know, yeah. So uh, <laughs> um, this, is, this is kind of what I'm doing with my cash value that aligns with the vision instead of just being like, oh, everyone should buy a business or everyone should buy real estate or everyone should buy crypto. I start thinking about like, well, what's happening to my cash? And it's nice that I have this cash and my cash value because when I just sold my house, I put some of the money back in the cash value. I'm not in a rush to go use all of it, but I am thinking about that a lot more. And that is a brilliant holding tank for my cash. I really do think that. And it's also, if something happens to me, this money comes in tax free to my family so that we can have a, a dynasty level trust that kind of becomes a family bank, which means we never have to use the banking system again. We can do everything within our own family, charge an interest rate to our heirs that's better than what the banks are charging earn some interest on that, save them interest on that, and kind of have something that's more of a perpetual wealth machine versus a, I don't know, I just, I don't love that every bank has the biggest building in every downtown. Like, I, I'm considered fairly wealthy, but I don't have a room for my money. They always have rooms for their money. That's pretty amazing. And they don't have any product. They don't even give you toasters anymore. They do have suckers to let you know that you're a sucker when you're making your deposits. But other than that, you know, so, so I like this philosophy of having cash value insurance, earning more than I'm earning in a savings account, still having access to that cash, having the benefit that protects my family. So even though my, there's an evolution to not just letting that sit there forever, like I, I have used it for crypto. I have used it for some real estate that benefits what I'm up to. When it comes to your family bank, do you create written agreements for family members to keep it official or is it more of an honor system? That is a really great question, Randy. Randy, we've been 
working on this a little. I'm not going to say it's been a, a massive undertaking, but it's been conversations with underwriters and, and bankers to create a basic underwriting process that's not as stringent, but still has some degree of like process. And yes, have actual loan notes so that they're learning the lessons and you can actually help that improve credit if needed as well through that reporting. So we're in process of that because my kids are as young as they are. Um, you know, I don't have it all the way done, but I have talked to people that own institutions. I have talked to people that deal with, you know, uh, they have tranches of money that they, that they put out there and like getting some of their processes. And we actually have a financial guy that we're working with who's actually putting all of that together. Not sure when that's all gonna be done, but I do think that's an important part of the process. So it's not just like, ah, I'm gonna go to the sugar daddy and get a little cash and oops, didn't pay it back. Oh, well, can I have some more? You know, I mean, obviously it's not gonna be that extreme, but, but I think it's important that there's, a, there, there's some due diligence, that there's a little bit of process behind it. And, and some of the unique things we wanna put in there is if they lose the money or they have problems, they have to teach siblings or other heirs or other people that are tapping into the bank their greatest lessons. Like what happened, what would they do differently? Because what we're trying to do is, is bank mental capital, not just financial capital. And then in that bank, it's like all of a sudden there's, there's basic instruction and guidelines and lessons and, and things that people can learn. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's, a, that's a really good question. When it comes to those agreements, Garrett, do you put those up or like, do you have um, meetings with your board or your family, like on a quarterly basis where you review or where you plan to review some of the agreements that were established, make sure people are kind of on track and following um, what you put in place or what would you say to that? The plan is quarterly. The plan is quarterly meetings. I have not initiated that just because we haven't been utilizing it yet, but quarterly is kind of the frequency. And then now with all the great technology like Zoom that we're on here, um, when there is an application, see, because I'm not wanting to pay the board right now. I'm not wanting to send all this money out. So it's more like when it's time, then I can, then I'm selective with how I'm utilizing them and getting the, getting the basics. And a lot of it, my wife and I can take care of now. Um, but in the future, if something happens to us, we just had this conversation while we we're in Chicago last week is like, how much do we really have to pay the board to make sure they're fully engaged? And, you know, because, and, and also we looked at the board and said, is there anyone that doesn't fully have my back? So if something happens to me, would they place any seed of doubt in my heirs? And we actually fired the, the trust protector over the weekend um, because they had said things that, that, um, that we felt were not consistent with how we want our family brand run. So, uh, and that was not an easy one, but it was overdue because you know, they say, oh yeah, you, you use the term family constitution, it's not a constitution. I'm like, actually it is because we invent things and then if you're gonna plant a seed of doubt, then it's a problem. So. So, yep. How do you go about selecting who's on your board, Garrett? Like, do you have, uh, there are like four or five of um, those individuals and do each of them have distinct characteristics and qualities that represent different values of the family or how do you go about that selection process? Yeah, so the, the way that I do that is, I say, if I'm not around, who represents each one of these main values the best that I would look up to or that I would, that I would go to for, advice. And so whether it's on sole purpose, whether it's financial management, whether it's fun and adventure, like, so I picked five people that I thought each one of them is probably better at this segment they represent than I am. And so they could really influence the kids that way. If I'm not around, some of that becomes less important as my kids get older. And it's more about, do they understand the family constitution and what we stand for from a values, principles, and contribution? Because it's going to be dynamic because who, who knows what it's going to look like 20 years from now. I, I have no clue what artificial intelligence, if it actually going to be intelligent one day or still stupid like it is today. Um, I don't know, you know, what kind of, what kind of world we're going to be living in as far as really needing people to defend themselves against the perils of what the government's doing to overstep their bounds. You know, like th that's really important that we're on the same page with that. So this is something that, that we actually have a workbook in the women play playbook where we go through an exercise of how to select your board of directors. 
and then in selecting those, how to invite them in to be part of your board of directors. So, and then we let, the, the way I really invited them was I had my family constitution, I sent it to them, they read it, they're like, it would be an honor because now they're learning how to do this in their own family by being part of this with my family. Um, and then right before COVID hit, we were trying to have a, a, a retreat with all of the board up at the cabin. Um, and I was a little COVID crazy through March of 2020. So I, I isolated myself from the entire world, made all my own meals. And when my wife asked me to go on a walk in the park, I thought she was a crazy witch for asking me to go in public. And now I'm on the other side where I'm like, I'm not afraid of anything. I've had COVID and I, I will lick doorknobs at this point. I'm not concerned. I have a really strong immune system. I'm super happy about that. Want to master your money? Want to figure out the things that you could do to improve your finances? Click here and check out more videos like this on Money Matters.